everybody today to uh, another day that the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it, aren't we? Uh, January 7th, Installation of new officer, January 9th, the trustees meet, uh, January 16th, session, and January 14th, following worship, the annual luncheon and meeting. Uh, today we're going to welcome Mr. Malott to the pulpit. Uh, many of you know him. Uh, are there any announcements that I'm forgetting? Because I always did that. We're going to take decorations down on Tuesday at 9. Okay. And if some people can help bring boxes down after church, we would appreciate it. Tuesday at 9, taking the decorations down. Anybody can hang around and bring boxes down after service. That would be good. Yeah, it would take a couple minutes. Yep. Okay. Well, praise God. It works for Pastor Ken. Come on, <laughs> praise God. Praise God. Uh, there sure is a lot of sickness going around in our congregation and in the valley, so uh, it's up to you whether you want to greet with the love of the Lord or just wave with the Lord, love of the Lord. But let's greet each other. Okay, we're going to sing All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, number 97. Problems, and we were working on him and his driver called from Vermont 
with an oversized load on, and he had transmission trouble. So, praise God, we got them both done. He picked it up yesterday. The last one, they hauled the one, they took one up, hauled the other, hauled the load, loaded the other one, brought it back. We got it out, got it repaired, and back in. And I just praise God for all that He does every day. Um, so many things He does that I take for granted. And you've heard me say that before. Uh, the more you trust God, the more you see what all He does. So, if there's no other testimonies, ah. so we had just a joy this past week of um, <clears throat> sharing Christmas with our family. Um, two grandchildren, one on the way. Just that joy of a child watching them. Yep, praise God. Just remind you to be thankful for those simple things every day. Yep, yep. with every breath we take. <laughs> yep. Any others? And state one last night. <laughs> Even though they were saying Washington was going to win, the announcers were saying, I was so glad. Yep. Yep, we can praise God in anything, that's for sure. Uh, prayer requests. I know that uh, we got word that Walter's not doing very good. Uh, are there any others that need added to what's on our list? Yeah, I know Sally talked to Donna last night. They told us Park Cabins was going to be canceled. That's why I'm here and didn't go over there. Um, and, okay. Well, then let's, uh, if there's no other, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity again to lift up those that need your healing touch, body, mind, spirit, and soul. Father, you know those on our list better than we know what they need. We lift up Ivan and Kathy and Greg, Father and Walter. We lift them up to your mighty healing powers. For Kirk and Julie as they travel, for Joel as he goes back, Father, we do ask for your protection upon him and them, and Pastor Ken and Deborah as they travel. Father, there's so many people on our list that sometimes we forget their names and forget to lift them up, and we ask for your forgiveness for that. But we know that you know what they need before we even ask, because you are a good, good Father. We thank you and praise you for that. And we ask your blessings upon our government, all our leaders, Father, our military, that they would be true to you, Father, that we would all continue to build that good, solid foundation based on your truths. For without you, we have no hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Man, we're down to receiving the tithes and offerings already.
you that we can return some of what you have blessed us with all to your glory. We do ask that you multiply it for use to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. And I don't see any children, so I guess I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Malott. Uh, right before you start, we'll sing G96. States and other countries of the world, 
the Gideons are involved in handing out God's word to the men and women in the military, or is, is there inducted into it? And Kruno uh, said he'd been searching. He was nominally raised a Christian, but he'd been searching. And it was through that little testament I talked to him afterwards that he came to Christ. It wasn't too long after that that Kruno met a young lady, a Betsy, from uh, Martinsburg, West Virginia, and they were married and they're living in the Martinsburg or uh, Hedgesville area now. I think Kruno's involved in driving a truck. See, God's word has a purpose, and we know I like to think about it with the rainfall. And whenever it rains, you know, we're told here that God sends the rain, his blessings, uh, on the just and on the unjust. Wouldn't it be something if, the, if it rained on your side of the road, you got rain and your garden grew across the road, your neighbor's garden withered and died. And it's the same way with his word. He wants his word to be added to the entire world and to achieve uh, the purpose that it has. And in order for that to happen, it has to get into the hands of the people. And of course, it's, here we are at Christmas season, thinking about uh, you know, Jesus coming to earth and uh, living and dying and resurrecting for us. And when you think about just before his ascension, there in uh, Matthew, with what we call the Great Commission, where he tells us to go. And then in Acts, it's almost repeated there in Acts 1 8, but except there, instead of saying go, it says, uh, when, as you're going, it's implying that we will go, that we will, that we will tell. And that's, think of that great responsibility. If you were going, well, let's say if you took off to Florida for a couple of weeks, that might not be such a bad idea. And you decided you're going to Florida for a couple of weeks and you're going to have somebody look out over your home and make sure your pipes haven't frozen up, maybe feed your pets. You're going to choose someone that you trust, someone who's reliable to do that. Well, because you're giving them a responsibility. Think of the responsibility that God gave us to take his word to all the world. What a responsibility that is. And that's the goal of the Gideons. Uh, like to think that sometimes when we're getting the word out, we're planting. But more often than not, I'd uh, like to think that we're, we're sowing the word. No. Think about when you out here in a couple of months when it does warm up, if you're going to plant grass. And you plant that grass, you wait and spread it. You know, Jesus taught that parable about the sower that went out. And the, the birds got some of the seed and never had a chance to grow. Some of it started to grow and the weeds choked it out. But some of it grew and produced a, quite a crop. It produced the harvest that it was intended for. And then sometimes we go out, and that's generally the way it is with our Gideon Scripture distributions. If it's a college campus, or in a school where you're going out and giving back sort of the sewing procedure. And then there are times, of course, when it's uh, more of like a planting, like when you're going to put your potatoes or your onions in the ground in the spring, one at a time. And that's where it comes in with what we call our uh, personal uh, workers' testaments, the little testaments that we have that uh, we buy them ourselves and pass them out and give them out hopefully every time with a word of witness. But you know, sometimes we'll hear people after there's been a distribution, say on a college campus, uh, especially, and they'll come back and they'll find where there, there have been scriptures that have been thrown away. That's going to happen. Unfortunately, it, it does happen. But there, it's interesting, there are testimonies that come back of where people even who have found some of those. I remember at our state convention a few years ago, a lady by the name of Shannon Bettis, from, I think she's from Texas. And Shannon told how she was married, and she and her husband had a small daughter. But her goal in life was not her family. Her goal in life was money, her work, her occupation, her career. And she left her husband, separated from him, and was living apart. She actually, they were divorced then. But she said she liked to run. And she went and run at night. One night she was out running in the heavy rain, and there was a bolt of lightning. She saw something along the road lane. She thought it was a wallet. And she picked it up, stuck it in her pocket, and kept on running. It wasn't a wallet. It was one of those testaments that someone had thrown away. Praise God. And she told how as she went along with that testament, took it home with her, and began to read it. I don't know how long it took her, but the truth of it finally sunk into her. And she came to Christ. Of course, she had a problem now. What about her, by now, her ex-husband? It took, I believe she said it was five years to finally convince him that she had really changed, that the change was real, and their, their family was reunited. 
So some soils are going to be more receptive than others. Uh, unfortunately, anymore, it seems like in many areas of the world where the church goes through more difficulties than we do here, that there's even more uh, openness to receive the word. The soil is more fertile in many of those areas. You know, different missions, different mission groups have you know, different avenues of work that they do. Some will have schools for training their children. Some will have seminaries. Some with a medical work in this. People come in for medical treatment to witness to. Some with a, a broadcasting, especially anymore, where the word can be broadcast into areas where you're not allowed to win distribute or where a pastor, anybody wouldn't even be allowed to win and to teach or preach. Or some involved in establishing churches around in other areas of the world. Well, the Gideon ministry doesn't do any of those things. I always like to say, really, a, a, a partner of the local church, a branch, an outreach, extended arm of the local church, not doing any of those things, but working with the churches and doing what we as individuals wouldn't be able to do and getting the word out. We can't all travel the world. You know, the Gideon work right now is in that just a little over, I think it's about 201 countries and territories of the world. We can't all go to those places every week or every year or every, even our lifetime. But there are Gideons there, auxiliary members there, willing to do the work and work in our partnerships. I like to think that the way we operate, a little bit like in Acts 1-8, where he says, you know, to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, then to the uttermost parts of the earth. And we're divided into local areas called camps. It has nothing to do with a literal camp. Just going back to the Old Testament there, uh, with Gideon and his camp. <clears throat> but uh, establishing those 121 of those camps uh, in Pennsylvania, scattered across Pennsylvania. And each camp has their area of uh, schools to service if possible, hotels to take care of, uh, other scripture distributions to do, hospitals, nursing homes, police, firemen, and of course uh, churches to, to work with and to help with those churches. We have that local area, and that's the way it is around the world. But then, you know, we'll reach out a little bit uh, farther than that into that, what we might call our Judea or our Samaria. You have to wonder back a little over 100 years ago when the Gideon ministry was started, if those men who started that had any idea of what was going to happen. Their idea was if they, these type of traveling salesmen, as they happened to run onto each other and uh, decided that wouldn't it be good if you could place a hotel, or place, yeah, place a hotel, place a Bible in every hotel room in the country. And I often thought if that hadn't been done, and somebody suggested that today, I'd probably look at it and wonder, you have a good idea, but how are you going to do all that? Yeah. And yet today, that's just a small, small, small part of the overall uh, Gideon ministry, placing those hotel, those hotel Bibles. It took like 20 years, 20 years, for the first million scriptures to be distributed. Now we're at the point of well over 2 billion. They're going out at the rate of about 2.5 uh, every second. I think in the current fiscal year, it's on track for about 85 million around the world. And most of those will be the little New Testament Psalms and Proverbs uh, going out into to schools and colleges. <coughs> Some of the areas of distribution of uh, hospital work, that started about 1950. And uh, again, that's getting a little more and more difficult with some of the HIPAA laws that they have now. And the new, large print New Testaments that's placed in the uh, bedside stands of hospitals is now in a, a shrink wrap. Because uh, my understanding is if it was just placed there something like this, then when the patient went home, they would have to go with them because of sanitary reasons. And so they're placed in that shrink wrap and then can be clean, can, be, can, can remain there. If you're ever in a hospital and you, know, you ask the chaplains if there aren't any in the desk in the rooms, the chaplain certainly would have them available. Remember a lady by the name of Marilyn Brewer, uh, her, her testimony. It's been a number of years ago that it happened, and you see maybe from her testimony, but she said about that years ago she'd been in the hospital uh, overnight and waiting surgery and reached into the nightstand. And there in that nightstand was that, that Bible. She picked it out and began to read it, and uh, she came to Christ as her Savior. And then she waited a long time until she shared that testimony. 
because she said at her baptism that some other family member did, and then finally, at the time she shared the testimony, uh, a teenage son, and she wrote, she said, you see, I have much to be thankful for as a result of that Gideon Bible. Thank you for all the hard work. Please keep on. Your Bibles do make a difference. Uh, the service testaments. Some of you may have received uh, when you were in the service. Uh, they tried to go down at uh, New Cumberland at the uh, entrance, the uh, military entrance station, and the one in western Pennsylvania. Uh, the Gideons tried to be there when men and women are being inducted into the service. And uh, all for them, it's a neat little camouflage testament now uh, with uh, the digital print on it keeping up to, to date, and also they're provided to military chaplains. Uh, the chaplains have, all they need to do is ask them wherever they are around the world, is ask for them, and they're provided to them to, to, to distribute to the soldier, I'll say whatever branch of the service uh, it is. Uh, school testaments. Now, help me out of this. The reason that this church is a part of ours and yoked with the Burn Cabin Church. I think the Franklin, the Franklin North Camp here is able to get in the school up here, I believe, and distribute the testaments. Anybody know? I'm not sure. I'm sure I meant to call someone. Uh, that's getting more and more difficult. In Fulton County, the three schools, we used to always get into the three, now it's down to the two. Uh, and you can understand for legal reasons why that's the case anymore. Where that can't be done, <coughs> where that can't be done, we had to do uh, what's called sidewalk distributions. Well, out here in the country, we don't have any sidewalks. Kids all ride the bus to school. So there's no way you're going to get, a side, get them on a sidewalk as they're going to or from school. But that's interesting when you get in now. Uh, in the September, last September, we had a, in fact, it's every September in New York City, uh, a major distribution effort. Because I said about reaching out into your Judea and Samaria, you get into the, uh, the big cities of the country, whether it's New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Pittsburgh, any of them. Uh, you know, very, very few evangelical churches involved there, and very, very few Gideons. So they get that special effort in New York City every September, what they call a blitz, is to bring anybody who can come in and help for a day or two days. This year it started, I think it ran from, a, started over the weekend and ran up through Wednesday of the following week. And I was up for, what, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Had a great time, but uh, school distributions—you just assume you had to do them on the sidewalk, and uh, you, know, you weren't always welcome on the sidewalk. The one school we went to, the fellow came up to us and really gave us a rough time, and uh, didn't think we ought to be there right on the the public sidewalk. And that, that's common anywhere you go. So you just have to face up to it. Think about a fellow Gary Linton, as Gary Linton uh, says he received his testament in school, probably his figures in the fifth grade, and that's the goal here. The goal around the world is to hand them out to students in fifth grade and above. Fifth grade and above. And but he says by the time he was 17, missing school, constantly drunk. And he said one night he began to consider his situation. He remembered that little testament that he had been given. He remembered, for some reason, he remembered John 3:16. So he said. He took that testament out and he began to read John 3, 16, and then he read further and accepted Christ that night. He said, began to attend churches. He went to school. The principal of the school saw such a change to him and wanted him to change lunch times. The group he was eating with at lunch because he could deal so effectively with some of his students. I like what he said. He said, the government took a Bible off my teacher's desk. The Gideons put a Bible in my hand. And the Holy Spirit put the word of God in my heart praise and the words of joy in my mouth. Praise be to God. Yes, praise uh, God. Colleges and universities. Uh, that didn't start. That's one of the more recent ones. That didn't start until 1972. Uh, going to college campuses and where possible, uh, positioning on the campus. Uh, sometimes that's possible, sometimes not. I know just uh, recently, the uh, what's called the Cumberland South Camp, Shippensburg area, uh, gave out several hundred one day on the campus at Shippensburg. So they were able to, uh, to get in there. And where you can't do that, go out on the sidewalks again. Uh, every September at Penn State, uh, being probably 25 or 30, uh, get in to go in to help the local fellows there in Center County with that day of distributions. They can put a couple people at the, the library on campus, but that's it. But you can go out on the streets of State College. And the last few years, in that day, they've been able to distribute around 7,000 testaments 
uh, on that day. Had an interesting situation uh, the year before last, yeah, a year ago in September. Uh, one of our fellows <coughs> from down in Lancaster County, a girl came up to him. She was from Cameroon, and she was telling him how she had received her testament in Cameroon when she was a young student there. And whether that's uh, wherever it is, that the same procedure is used there. You know, it's interesting, those testimonies that come back from college campuses. A few years ago, brothers, the Gillespie brothers, Keith and uh, Kevin Gillespie in Wisconsin. And they were living at home, traveling back and forth to college. One day on the campus, the Gideons were there handing out testaments. And of course, Keith received one, Kevin received one. They hadn't said anything about it to each other. Now they you know, were unlikely candidates, perhaps. Their mother was a Christian, she prayed for them, but they had said in their own hearts that they were going to be atheists. They were not going to be Christian. Well, they took those Bibles, and Kevin tells how that day, every time he had an opportunity, he'd sit and read, he'd sit and read, and accepted Christ. Wow. What was he going to do about his brother when they had said, we're going to be atheists? So he went to his brother's room that night and knocked on the door. When his brother, uh, Keith, opened the door, he had done the same thing. And they're both actively involved in serving the, the Lord now. So you never know the effectiveness of that one scripture. Uh, hotels. That's one you hear sometimes in the news. If you ever go to a hotel and they don't have the Bible in the room, uh, ask them for one. Even if you have your own, web, own Bible with you, ask them for one. You'll realize there is a demand, there is a request for these. And sad to say, some of the hotels now are not allowing them to be placed into the rooms. Uh, a few years ago, I guess probably about five years ago, our state convention was at, at the uh, Penn State, or Penn State, which is a part of the university there. And after the contracts were all signed and everything was agreed upon, uh, that and the, uh, the other hotel that's part of the campus uh, removed the Bibles from the, uh, from the rooms. Well, you couldn't do it. Some people, oh man, we shouldn't go there for the convention. Well, you couldn't do that after the contracts were already signed. You had to honor that the contract. So that does happen at times when they are removed from rooms. Um, in, the, uh, in Philadelphia, in October, there was a major distribution effort because there's only a few active Gideons in the whole city of Philadelphia. And this place reached out into uh, Bucks and Montgomery and Delaware counties as well. But uh, some of the hotels there, the one I went out with one day, they would not allow them to be placed. There was another one where they had taken them to <coughs> in the call. They wanted them to come and get them. So, I mean, there's nothing we can do about that except live with it. On the good hand, uh, I know a few years ago, one of the new ones that was opened there in Chambersburg, and I'm not sure which one it was, but it was one of the new ones, I think they're a very long Interstate 81. And uh, one of the fellows there, uh, Went home that evening, he actually had been up to a farm or up to Penn State, something going on. And his wife says to him, oh, uh, you're supposed to call so-and-so at this hotel. He said, oh, he said, they probably want Bibles. And she said, yes, today. And what happened was that they were to be inspected by whichever franchise it was. And that was the expectation of the, the franchise was that each hotel would have the Bibles placed in the room. So, you know, we can be glad be glad for examples uh, such as that. I think of uh, you know, the testimonies that come in from the uh, hotels. The gentleman actually going to be speaking at a, uh, here in Pennsylvania, I know in the spring, but uh, currently living in North Carolina, Elliot Osterman. And Elliot tells how uh, he was just traveling sales rep of some kind, living a terrible life. Went home, I think it was on Christmas Eve in the late 90s, and his wife had him locked back. They went to a hotel, he stayed at a hotel. He was going to commit suicide. And there, as he saw that Bible up on the table, the desk, kicked it, went to kick it on the floor, under the bed, and wouldn't go. He picked it up and began to read. And he began to read. And he spent a couple days there. He called his wife, and she sent a pastor. And uh, as a result of that, Elliot Oswick is a, uh, is a pastor in, uh, in North Carolina today. Uh, the Bibles that are placed in the hotels, this happens to be red, they're all different colors. If you went to Hershey, you might guess there's a chocolate brown, but it's just whatever color we happen to order them in. But we try to, we're supposed to try to check them twice a year, because you never know uh, what might have happened to them. This is one that I particularly pulled out of, I guess, in Breezewood, but in the cover here is a whole bunch of phone numbers. Somebody probably 
business person writing down numbers that they needed to call. Um, remember one time a person wrote in the cover, if anyone knows where there's a place that doesn't have these Bibles, let me know. I'm tired of seeing them every place I go. Well, they didn't have their phone number, so we couldn't call them and, uh, and tell them. But we tried to replace them with a nice, crisp, new one. Then these used ones, they're, they're not wasted. Uh, they go to prisons, because in most cases, in the prison, prison Bibles, they have to have the hard cover taken off for security anyhow, a uh, little soft cover put on them. So uh, they, they go to the prisons. Always remember, it been several years ago now, but it was after uh, September 11th happened, following Sunday, I think it was, I was in a in church in Shippensburg, there on Prince Street. And a young lady came up to me, and her brother was just being transferred, that week her had been transferred uh, from the Franklin County Jail to the prison at Camp Hill. And uh, she was one, he wasn't allowed to take anything with him. And she was wondering how she could get a Bible in his hands once he got settled into the prison. And of course told her to uh, contact the chaplain there, contact the chaplain and he'll be able to, to take care of that uh, with her. Uh, David Grant, who lives in uh, New Alexandria, Ohio, near Columbus, uh, tells about how when he was in prison, when nothing to do with God, nothing to do with the Bible, a very, what we say, uncooperative a prisoner, to put it mildly. And they put him in solitary confinement. And he said one day, when they came around with the food, when the slot where they put his food, they put one of those Bibles, and he said he took it, he pitched it back behind him. He didn't want anything to do with it. He didn't even want to read it. But boy, there he was, alone in his cell. I guess no radio or TV or anything. He, David, began to read it. David began to read it uh, and, and accepted Christ as a result of receiving that Bible. Now, I said a little bit ago about most of the scriptures that are distributed are the little New Testaments. They don't all look like this, but very similar. They have uh, neat little helps in the front, uh, help in time of need, uh, and then in the back has the, the plan of salvation and asking them to seek a church. In fact, that internationally right now is about 80% of all the worldwide scriptures that are distributed are outside the United States. Uh, who would have thought, say, in the early 1980s, you'd be able to get into what was then the Soviet Union. Now all those republics that have broken off uh, from what was the Soviet Union and be able to go in and to distribute scriptures in those. And now, been somewhere probably, I guess, over 85 million that have been distributed there uh, since 1989 when the doors were open. Think about why help is needed in many of those countries. Uh, those approximately 200, maybe 202 countries now, somewhere about 170 of them are looking to us to help them supply the scriptures. In some cases, there's just a small, small portion of the people who are Christians. You take some of the, uh, where the Muslims are predominant, uh, some of the African countries or the Middle Eastern countries. And by the way, of those countries, you know, where the work can be done, often think of uh, one time, and I think it was the Church of the Nazarene, and they had a map on the wall that showed the countries of the world where the Nazarene church had ministries, and of course the countries where they didn't. And that was just about a perfect overlay with where the Gideons could not be organized. Most of those countries across North Africa, you, know, you couldn't go in there and say we're going in to distribute scriptures. Uh, most of the countries of the Middle East, some of them are surprised. Egypt, it, it does, the work does one in Egypt, but most of those Middle Eastern countries across the Middle East, India, strong work going on in India. In fact, one of the fellows from India was speaking here a couple summers ago, and uh, he said that if they had 25 million scriptures a year in India, that they'd be able to distribute them. And of course, there it's predominantly, overwhelmingly uh, a Hindu, a Hindu country. But they're, they're looking, they're seeking, they're reaching out for help. The work is done, first of all, by the local Gideons as much as possible, just, just like we do here. Just this year, we'll reach out. People would go into a state college and help one that day to swarm the area with someone there to hand out the word or the, a blitz such as in Philadelphia or uh, next October, early October uh, in Erie, Pennsylvania. And the same idea, and then we'll reach out into what are called uh, international blitzes. Uh, this, coming, this coming year, the year starts tomorrow, isn't it? Uh, 2018, I think there are 16 of those blitzes uh, scheduled around the world. I had the opportunity in uh, June 
to uh, go to Central America for two weeks. And there's a team of 21 of us, 20 of us from the United States, and uh, one from Australia. And we spent a week, first week in Nicaragua, and the second week we spent in uh, Costa Rica. And doing the distributions just like we do here, and the 21 of us with dozens and dozens of local Gideons, and always the same people every day. But I was blessed the first week in uh, working with a team of fellows. It was myself and the, the David Holm from Australia, and then a local Gideon there who was just an enthusiastic fellow, and then two young fellows uh, who were our, our interpreters for the week. And uh, we were involved in school distribution. And there we were able to go out and some of them traveling a good distance some days, but in most cases <coughs> to go into the schools. And we'd go into the classroom and so she had about five minutes and go in and talk to the students and uh, tell them who you were while someone started passing them out and, uh, you know, and show them the helps and the plan of salvation in the back. And uh, just overwhelming support there. There were some schools that you could not get into as, as it is here. And in those cases, you know, he had referred to a, a sidewalk distribution. Uh, the one day in, uh, in uh, Costa Rica, in fact, the first day we were there on a Monday, and uh, <coughs> everybody was involved in a big distribution uh, at, a big, at a university there in Costa Rica. And there it was almost the same as going on to a campus here in the United States. The polite objections. No, well, one person I'll tell you about did get a little rude, but everybody was polite when they were rejecting. But uh, you know, you're going to have a lot of rejections when you get on university campuses today. Uh, one fellow from uh, Mississippi, Kevin Vance was his name. And uh, in fact, I didn't realize at the time who the fellow was talking to him. But he was telling us the one evening of uh, the fellow that came up to him and a uh, philosophy professor there on the campus. And in his face and really objecting to, to what we were doing and we shouldn't be there. And really gave Kevin a rough time. Well, that you know is perhaps to, to, to be expected. But again, you know, we can't can't let that stop us. And on those blitzes, uh, Gideons go at their, their own expense, cover their own expenses, and working, uh, like I said, in 16 of them uh, coming up this year. I know one of our fellows from uh, Lancaster County is going to be on one to uh, to Mexico in uh, it's February or March that, that that he'll be going. Okay. Uh, I don't need to ask you this. Probably nearly all of you are on the internet in some way or another or with a phone. It's glad you had a clock back here because I left my phone laying out in the car. I don't usually wear a watch. I looked like, okay, there is a clock there. Um, but uh, you, know, you can log on. It's very simple. Just uh, Gideons.org, www.gideons.org. There's all kinds of information, all kinds of information that, that you can get there, testimonies that are given. Uh, all kinds of news. And also, on your phone, again, I should, should have some cards with me. I don't, but get it. Again, it's uh, the Gideon Bible app. It's available on, with Apple or uh, Android. Uh, but the Gideon Bible app, and you can download it there. And the Bible is there in, <clears throat> last I looked, it was 1,217 different languages. And realize we were that many around the world. And in many of them, you can listen to it. Have just your phone in, it's good you're traveling down the road if you're walking, just to, uh, just to listen to it. Uh, another thing that's come out just a couple of years ago that is uh, working out very well, since you're not able to get into schools like you would, as you would like to, um, is uh, a, what's called a life book. And the life book is just about the size of a CD. That's intentional. And it's the Gospel of John. And then it has in there as if these students are talking and writing notes in, and they're provided to the students to go into, to hand out in the schools. If the idiots can't get in, the students have to be there. So they're available for them to distribute. And they're available at, at when they came, at first came out with it, I think you had to order like 500, which I wondered why in the area where we live, why you'd have to order so many. I think it's that now we can get maybe 100. But we can't get them as good as the pastors have to go on and order them. The intention there is for the teenagers in the school, the teenagers to go in and give them out one to one uh, to their to, to their friends, going where we can. Another little thing we have, if you'd be interested here, uh, new thing, Friends of the Gideons, and uh, just to be one of those little brochures on that, I have a few of them with me. Uh, on the life book thing, you might remember a few years ago, the girl, uh, down James Buchanan, as she was pulling out of the parking lot and was killed in a, a car accident there. 
uh, Violet was her name. And it hadn't been too long before that that the Gideon representative had been to, uh, to her church, I think Seven Days of United Brethren, and explained about the uh, uh, program here, the Life Book. And the pastor ordered that. And I think that girl, not long before she was killed, had handed out a whole box, like of a hundred of them herself, to students there in the school. In fact, there was a nice article about it in our Gideon magazine that comes up several times a year. So just uh, thank you. I'll get a letter off to uh, Pastor Richards for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for the opportunity of being here, your attention. I'm in no big rush to leave. If you have any questions, anything you want to know, try to answer as best we can. If I don't know the answer, it's probably under www.gideons.org. Thank you very much. God bless you.